welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Now here's the deal. Sometimes when we approach the Word of God, we're encouraged, we're exhorted. I mean, just to preach, you want to wave your hanky and all that kind of stuff, you know, and, and stand up and shout and do a little Holy Ghost jig. Other times, the Word of God comes to us with the gift of teaching. Okay, and God wants to teach and to build things into our life that help us and encourage us in the way of the Lord so that we can understand how God is, how he operates. Today, we're going to be on that side of teaching more than the real preaching. We'll, we'll, we'll get out and preach a little bit too, okay? We'll have some fun in the word of God today. But I really need you to give your interest, give your attention. Maybe you've heard it this way, put your thinking cap on so that... that gray matter between your ears, you know, it, it, it may hurt a little bit, but it's okay. I, I promise you, you're going to get something out of the Word today if you apply yourself to understand, okay? So if you would, let's honor the Lord. Stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's go before the Lord together today in prayer. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks and praise that we get to come into your house freely and openly, God. We can lift our hands and worship and praise you. Thank you for your presence already in this place, God, and for what you've already done. God, we don't want to stop there. We want to hear from the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church. We don't want to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, or any other color, God. We want to hear from you. So as we open up your word today, God, we pray that you open it up to us. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. And Lord, we commit to give our attention, give our interest, to get involved in this and apply ourselves to understanding so that we can hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church this day. God, we thank you, Lord, that you can take that word and plant it in our hearts, and it can produce something in each and every one of our individual lives, how wise and how awesome you are. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches all over the planet, Lord, that are preaching the gospel and lifting up Jesus. They're our brothers and sisters, Lord, and we bless them this day that you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say amen. amen. As you're having a seat, get your Bible out and go with me to the wonderful text of Hebrews, the sixth chapter. Hebrews chapter 6, being a couple verses in Hebrews chapter 6, going line upon line, precept upon precept. Title of today's message as you're turning to Hebrews 6 is The Amazing Agreement of God. Now, I mentioned to you that we go line upon line, precept upon precept. We are continuing our, our thought process through the Word of God because when this was written, there was not chapter and verse like we have today. That was done so that we could easily find stuff, so that there's an understanding. And yet when this was written, it was one thought. There was a letter that was written, and so the thought process is going on. So today as we read through the verses, it can almost sound like God is repeating himself as we go through some of the concepts, some of the things that we've already seen and already looked at. But there's a reason for that, and the reason is that this was not written in chapter and verse. It was not meant to just be this by itself. It was a complete thought. And so the author is developing things and, and encouraging us and teaching us the wisdom of God throughout the text. Hebrews chapter 6, talking about the amazing agreement of God. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 16, starting out, says this. It says, For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Now, remember, we had heard that God had swore an oath by himself, because he could swear by no one greater. Now, in the natural example here in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse number 16, it says, For men, people here on earth, indeed swear by the greater, and an oath is confirmation for them and end of all dispute. Verse 17, Thus God determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Verse number 18, That by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. Now, there are a lot of terms in these three verses that we took a look at that we don't use in our everyday language. Let's take a look at it. Let's break it down a little bit so that we can understand where we're going today. First of all, in verse number 16, it says, Men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Now, we understand this in the natural, that when there is an agreement, people are saying, I'm going to do this. There may be some uncertainty. Somebody might say, well, I don't know you. I don't know how much money you have or how wise you are, how smart you are, how strong you are. Therefore, I want you to not only give me your word and your promise, I want you to swear an oath. But I don't want you to swear an oath by something less than you because that, that doesn't do anything for me. I want you to swear by something greater than you are. So they swear by the heavens, by the earth, by the temple, by any number of things. They could swear by something that was greater to, than them, and that would hold them accountable to what they are going to do. Are you listening today? So it goes on to say, 
that an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all dispute. So if there were two parties that were in disagreement and they said, well, listen, we're going to come together, we're going to make this agreement, and in order to end the dispute, I swear that this is going to take place, at that moment they would say, okay, you swear? All right, then I know it's going to happen because you swore an oath. That would end the dispute. Verse number 17, thus God, now all of a sudden we go from the natural example to the spiritual reality, thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise. So God said, listen, I don't have to do this. I don't have to swear an oath, and yet I want to more abundantly show the heirs of promise, that's us, that I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. So he not only made a promise, but he also confirmed it with an oath. So he says, determining to show more abundantly the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel. Now, I don't know about you, but I have not used the word immutable in my everyday language ever. We, don't, we just don't use that term. Immutable, what does that mean? I, I don't know. Here's what it means. It means unchangeable. It means that it's not going to turn. It's not going to be different. It will always be that way. So God wanted to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise. He wanted to show us more abundantly the unchangeableness of his counsel, his will, his plan here on the earth. How did he do that? He confirmed it by an oath. Verse number 18, by that, that by two immutable things, two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. So what are those two immutable things? What are those two unchangeable things? Well, it's God's promise and God's oath. God is not going to go back on his promise, and now that God has swore oath, he is bound to his word to perform it. Otherwise, he will no longer be God. But we know that it's impossible for God to lie. He does not have the will to do it. He cannot do it because he is perfect. Therefore, we have not just consolation, strong consolation. We can be sure that what God said, he will do. And then the terminology comes along and it says, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. Now that terminology really speaks to the Hebrew believer at the time that would have known the Old Testament law and that there were cities of refuge in Israel that if somebody accidentally committed murder, they could run to that city of refuge to flee from the avenger of blood. If they were found out there in the field, the avenger of blood could murder them, kill them, and it would not be counted to them as sin because they had murdered a, a relative. But if they made it to the city of refuge and they fled to that city, as long as they stayed inside the city, as long as the high priest was alive, they were safe. Once the high priest died, then they could go out of that city. And so we find here that this is really speaking of us today. We are the heirs of promise, and we had committed wrong. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there was an avenger legally that was bound to come. The justice of God was coming against us. And if it found us outside of him then we would be punished. And yet, if we have fled to God, then we can have a strong consolation. We know that God will take care of us. God will keep us in the refuge under the shadow of his wings. And therefore, we are safe in his presence because God cannot lie. God will do what he said he would do. God's promise is sure in our life. Now, it's very interesting to note, in the New King James Version, we see that God confirmed with an oath. In the New Living Translation, it says he is bound with an oath. And in other versions, it says that he intervened or he interposed with an oath. In fact, let's read the New Living Translation, Hebrews 6, 16 through 18. In the New Living Translation, take a look at it with me up on the overheads. It says, now when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. Verse 17, God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. Wow. Verse number 18, so God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. So we see that God is bound with an oath. God confirmed it by an oath. Uh, God intervened. See, we were in a situation of sinfulness. We, we were out there on our own, and we could not save ourselves. So God had to intervene or interpose, some translations say. What does that mean? Really, it means that he had to mediate. Now, we understand in legal terms what a mediator is. Maybe you've been in a business or you've been in a marriage, something like that, and you had to go and sit with a mediator. What does a mediator do? Outside of court, the mediator represents both parties and brings these two parties that are at odds together into one agreement. 
And therefore, once they bring that agreement together, then that agreement goes into court, and then the gavel comes down that that's the way that it's going to be. So God says that he confirmed it with an oath. He intervened with an oath, or he mediated with an oath. Now, we know that Jesus Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. You'll find that all throughout the New Testament, that Jesus Christ himself is the mediator. He is the go-between between the two parties that were at war. See, we were at war with God. We were at odds with God. There was enmity, the Bible says. There was a war. We were sinful, and we were opposed to the way of God. And so God knew that we were in a predicament, and therefore he had to be a mediator. He had to come in with this amazing agreement, and he had to make the two become one. How did he do that? He broke from his side his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus comes to earth veiled in flesh. So he's 100% God, but he's also 100% man. Therefore, he could re represent God to man and man to God. Think about it. Jesus said no one has seen the Father at any time except the Son. And if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Therefore, he was representing God to man, but also he represents man to God. The Bible tells us that he suffered as we were, without sin. That he went through every trial, every temptation, every problem, every pressure. He experienced pain. And that he took upon our burden, our sin, our sickness on himself on the cross. In fact, he even took the punishment, the wrath of God that was being stored up for us who were disobedient. And it was poured out on Jesus on the cross. He took that on himself. And he mediated this new covenant, this new agreement with God. Now, throughout this text, we find there's a lot of legal terms. Swear, oath, intervene, confirm, immutable, heir. These are all legal terms. So God had a will. God had a desire. God had a counsel, like it says in our text. There was a plan of God. There was a purpose of God here on the earth. If you will, there was a last will and testament. We understand those terms, don't we? Because that last will and that testament stands until the person who put that last will and testament together until they die. Now, once they die, what happens? That last will and testament goes into effect, and now someone else inherits whatever it was that was in that will. So God had a testament. God had a desire. God had something that he wanted to do. There was an agreement that God had made that he was going to do something. He was going to take care of our sinful existence, going to take care of our lives. And therefore, when Jesus died on the cross, that last will and testament kicked into effect, and now we become the heirs of the inheritance of God. Now we're going to find out what that means as we go through today. He was so determined to carry it out that he made a covenant. He made an agreement. And he mediated it himself by swearing an oath. Now I just used a term a couple of times that I think we need to define for what we're talking about today. A covenant. What is a covenant? A covenant is a binding agreement. It is the closest and most sacred of all contracts. I've got that up for you on the overheads. So if you're taking notes, you can write that down. What is a covenant? A covenant is a binding agreement, the closest and most sacred of all contracts. Now, we understand contracts in today's society, today's terminology. Anybody who has bought a house understands covenants, right? Because you go to buy a house, and what do they do? They take you in escrow, and you go into that room. You ever been down to the escrow office, and they take you in that room? There's no windows. There, it's just this room with a table and a chair, and they sit you down and hover over you, and they pull out like a foot-tall stack of documents, blam, right? And they set it down in front of you, and they sign here, sign here, sign here, initial here, initial here, initial here, prick your finger in blood and sign at the bottom of this page, right? And you go through all this stuff, and you're just going, my goodness, what, what, why do I, you don't even want the keys after you're done. You just want to go home and go to bed. You don't care if you sleep anywhere. You just go sleep in the car, right? Maybe, maybe you bought a car, okay? You've gone down to the, the sales lot there, and you chopped it up with the, the, the sharks, you know, and you were out there, and, you, and sorry, salesmen, I love you guys. You guys are great. You're doing a good job, but man, hey, you know, we understand. So everybody's trying to get the deal, so you, you, you wore them down. You feel good about what, you, what you've done, and then they take you to the sales manager, all of a sudden, they're drawing pictures. They've got the square on the paper and this and that, and all this math is being done. It seems like the deal that you thought you were getting, all of a sudden, you're not getting that anymore. Then they take you into that room. I don't know what it is about the room, right? Take you into that room, and here's the finance guy, right? And he's sitting down there typing and saying, oh, yeah, you get this deal, and with this deal comes this and this and this, and do you want insurance? you want this? Do you want that? Do you want this? Oh, you wanted to actually have tires on the car? Well, that's going to cost you this. And, and, and all of a sudden, that great deal that you thought you got, all of a sudden, right? And, and they're getting you to monthly payments. And then they roll out like three foot long of paper, right? Sign here, sign here, sign here, initial here, initial here. And, and you're back to this whole thing. So that's it, agreement. What did you agree to? You agreed to pay a certain amount of money every month. 
And if you don't, they're going to come steal the car when you're not looking, right? You give it back to the bank. Same thing with your house. You're going to pay a certain amount every month. If you don't, they're going to repossess the house. You'll have foreclosure going on. That's an agreement. But that's kind of a weak example for what we're talking about today. I would say the best example for us in today's society that we can take a look at about if we're going to talk about covenant with God really is the example of marriage. Think about a marriage for a moment. A marriage is two people with different backgrounds, two people with different upbringings, maybe from different cultures even, different social or economic status. These two people are coming together in love. And as they come together in love, there's a ceremony that takes place. They swear an oath, I promise to love you for the rest of our lives. There are gifts that are exchanged. There's a meal that's eaten. There's all of this ceremony, all this pomp, and all this stuff that's going on. And then those two live together as one. No longer is it yours and mine, but now everything is ours. My lovely wife, who's uh, meeting right now and is not here, I can talk about her because she's gone. We, we, we were driving one time, and she was behind me in her car. I was up front in my car, and I started to, you know, kind of just scoot out a little bit to look around the bend to make sure there was no cars coming. And as I scooted out, all of a sudden, I wham! And I look behind me, and there's my wife. She hit me in, the, in her car. You know what she said to me afterwards? Oops, we had an accident. <laughs> now, before I get down too much on my wife, when I was pulling into my garage one time, I got a little too close to the side. You know, men pride themselves in how we can drive and all that. I got a little too close, and oh, I scraped the side of my car. And she says, honey, what, what did you do? I said, I didn't do anything. We had an accident. See, the two become one. It's not your kids, it's our kids. It's not my money, it's our money. Right? So everything is ours together. See, that's the same thing that happens when we get in covenant with God. It's no longer just him and us. Now it's we. We become one with the Lord. That's God's desire for our life. The binding agreement. Closest, most sacred of all contracts. Let me say this to you. God relates, explains, and joins himself to us. How? How? Through covenant. God relates, explains, and joins himself to us through covenant. All throughout the Bible, you find that God's calling card, that if we're going to relate to God, if we're going to find out about God, if we're going to understand God and his ways, his will, his counsel, his desires, that we've got to understand him and that God comes and he explains himself to us, he relates to us through covenant. So if you're going to have a relationship with God, you can't have it without covenant. If you're going to understand who God is, how he operates, why he does what he does, why, why, why he is a certain way, then you need to understand that through the eyes of covenant. And if you're going to be joined to the Lord, you cannot join him without covenant, this agreement. See, when you got saved, maybe you had never heard covenant before in your life. Maybe today is the first time you've ever heard anything about a covenant. And yet you could not get saved without covenant. You didn't have to understand it to get saved that had to be there in order for you to get saved. Are you hearing me today? So a couple things we're going to take a look at today about covenant, this amazing agreement of God. First thing is that God has bound himself to this agreement. God has bound himself to this agreement. Now, I know we talked about in Hebrews chapter 6 that God had sworn oath by himself, but let's take a look at this in greater measure. Turn to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter number 15. Genesis chapter number 15, we find a guy by the name of Abram. You and I know him as Abraham, right? Father Abraham. Now, we'll, we'll call him Abraham for our purposes because we know who he is, but you'll see in the text he's named Abram. His name had not been changed yet. God had called him out of the land that he was at, and so Abram went out in faith, believing God, trusting God in obedience. God told him, I'm going to give all this land to you and to your descendants after you. He believes God. God takes him on a walk one night and points him up to the heavens and says, take a look at all the stars, Abram. So shall your descendants be. And the Bible tells us that Abram believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness, the right way to do things. Now, God, as he's talking to Abraham, he says, your descendants I'm going to give this land to. And Abraham's looking around, and he hadn't had a child yet. And so he's kind of scratching his head, and he says, well, Lord, how's this going to happen? Now, this was an honest question. And I believe that God allowed this question and keeps it, preserves it in the Bible for you and I to see, because this was before the cross, this was before the Word of God was contained as it is in our present day. This was before, actually, they had any written account. So here God is speaking to Abraham, and he tells him, your descendants are going to have this, and he asks him another question. And so God allowed this question because, number one, it came from a heart that feared the Lord. Abraham feared God, 
And he was the friend of God. And so he was, he was coming in that relationship with God and saying, well, how's this, how am I going to know this is going to happen? Secondly, I believe that it pushed forward the plan and the purpose of God. God knew he wanted to do something, and therefore this question allowed that opportunity. And finally, it strengthened the faith of the believer. Abraham believed God, but he still was wavering in this area. And so God says, I want to strengthen you so you can ask that question because I'm going to make something happen here that's going to strengthen your faith. Now, with us today, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. So we know that God's promises are true. But we've got to get more grounded in the things of God. And so something happens here. Abraham asks God. He says, how am I going to know? And this is God's response. Listen to what God says back to Abraham. He, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 15, verse number 9. So he said to him, this is God speaking to Abraham in response to, how do I know this is going to happen? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. There's your answer, Abraham. This is how you're going to know. Bring me these animals. If I would have asked God a question, said, God, how do I know this is going to happen in my life? God said, bring me a bunch of animals. I would have said, um, God, not sure where you're going here. Are we going back to the ark? What's happening? That, that was two of each kind of animal, so I, I don't really know what's, what's taking place here, God. And yet, look at what Abraham does in verse number 10. It says, Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. Why did he know to do that? Why didn't he say, God, what are you doing? What's going on? That's a weird answer, God. No, rather than say that, he goes and he does something weird to us. He cuts the animals in two. He keeps the birds together. He arranges them on each side. And we're kind of sitting back, scratching our heads, wondering what's happening. See, the nations of the time, anytime that they would come into an agreement, anytime there was a covenant made, they would do something that they would call cutting covenant. They would cut covenant. In, in other words, they would sacrifice an animal. They would order the pieces in two. Then the two covenant partners, as they came together, they would stand back to back inside of the halves of the animals. And they would recite the covenant. They would swear an oath that we are going to do this. And then what they would do is they would walk through those pieces in a figure eight pattern. As they walked around, they would come back facing one another and they would stand back in between those pieces. And they would point to those halves of those animals and they would say, may it be done to me if I don't keep this covenant. That's how seriously they took their agreements. They say, let me die and be cut in half if I don't uphold my part of the bargain here. And so Abraham knows, how do I know that this is going to happen? Because God's getting in covenant. So he gets excited. He goes and he gets the animals. He cuts them in half. He puts them in the proper order. And then he waits. Let's take a look at what happens. Verse number 11. Verse number 11, it says, And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. See, Abram was waiting there long enough that birds started to come down on these bloody pieces of animals, these pieces of flesh, and so he shoes them away. I, I think maybe he was waiting for God to show up in some form so that he and God could walk through the pieces together. Verse number 12, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and a great darkness fell upon him. Verse 13, Then he, capital A, speaking of God, said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they will shall come out with great possessions. Verse 15, Now as for you, you shall go down to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So God says, how are you going to know Abraham? This is how you're going to know covenant. And yet, Abram knows certainly this is going to take place. He starts to speak to him of the future. He starts to talk to him of how his descendants will go down into Egypt, and there will be an exodus, and they will come out in the fourth generation. Now look at what takes place. Verse number 17. Verse number 17 says, And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold... There appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. Now, this is an amazing image that we get from the Word of God, that Abram did not pass through the pieces. Notice, there were two entities that passed through the pieces, two covenant partners that walked through those pieces, a, a, a smoking oven and a burning torch. Oftentimes in the Word of God, when you see the presence of God, it is veiled in a dark cloud. When Solomon built the temple and they consecrated the temple, the priests were there ministering and doing their service and they couldn't even minister because a dark cloud filled the temple and Solomon said, the Lord said his presence would be veiled in darkness. When the Lord descended on Mount Sinai and spoke to Moses, the mountain burned with fire and there was billowing smoke that came out everywhere, veiling the presence of God. 
Children of Israel were led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. See, we see God the Father there passing through the pieces, but also we see the flame, right? And we understand that our God is a consuming fire. That God comes and his presence is like fire. Jeremiah said, his word is shut up in my bones like fire. I try to keep it in, but indeed I cannot see. God the Father made an agreement with God the Son because of what he was wanting to do, what he was planning to do. And God himself bound himself in this agreement. In other words, Abram, you can't stay alive all this time and carry out the plan and the will of God. You are flesh, you are human, you are weak, and you cannot keep covenant. And yet, I can keep covenant. I can swear by myself, and I myself can pass through the pieces and make sure that this thing comes to pass. God bound himself in covenant. God's promises are God's gifts. You can be sure that whatever it is that God has said, God will do. When it comes to our salvation, how do I know God? Because Jesus went to the cross. He carried out covenant. He became the sacrifice on our behalf. And now every promise of God is open and available to us. You say, but pastor, hold on a second because I've got bills to pay right now. I'm suffering right now. My family's crazy right now. I just got laid off. My wife or my husband just left and I've got problems. Yeah, you've got problems, but you've got a covenant partner who cannot lie and he is bound to his word to do that which he said he was going to do. So you say, what does that mean? That means in your prayer time, don't go to God and bawling and squalling. Oh God, I hope that you can do something. God says, no, get a hold of the word of God and start to believe me for it. And then through faith and patience and endurance, you will inherit the promises. Why? Because God is bound to it. And he can't lie. When God says he will provide for all of your needs, you can go to the bank on that. Just watch and wait. Be obedient. Stay in faith, believe God, and endure, and God will pour out the blessing on your life. When it comes to your children, yeah, they might be wandering, they might be wavering, but stand on the promise of God that, God, I have raised them up in the way of the Lord, and even when they grow old, they shall not depart from it. Now, you might have to wait till they grow old, but guess what? They're coming back to their borders, the book of Jeremiah says. See, that's what this is all about. God is bound to his word. He has bound himself to this agreement. Second thing that we need to know and understand about the covenant, this amazing agreement of God is this, that we can either accept or we can reject it, but we cannot change it. You can either accept it or reject it, but you cannot change it. A lot of people wanting to get to God their own way. A lot of people saying, I'll be good enough. I will do enough, I will pray enough, I will attend church enough, I will hold to the, the, the strict laws. Man, a lot of people saying, oh, I'm, I'm celebrating the feast, and I'm going, and I'm doing this and that, and I've got the Sabbath, and I've got the meals, and I've got the... Listen, God says, none of that, none of that. All flesh cannot be justified in my sight. It's not going to make it, not your way, it's about his way. And you can't be good enough, you can't behave enough to get yourself to God. God is the one who upholds this covenant. On the opposite end of that, there's a lot of people saying, well, God did it all, and therefore, you know, I can just live however I want. And yet the Bible tells us that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So it's not about you can go and say you're a Christian and want to go to heaven and then live however you want to live for the rest of your life. No, there is a way of faith that God desires for us to live in our life, and therefore we can't do it our way. We're going to have to do it His way. And there's a new law that governs our lives. It is the law of love. And we are to make sure that we... Come in to covenant with God his way. You can either accept it or you can reject it, but you can't change it. You can't come to God on your own terms. There in the Old Testament, turn with me to the book of Galatians in the New Testament. Galatians, chapter number three. Y'all doing okay today? Amen. Praise the Lord. You're awful quiet. We're listening, Pastor. We're listening. Okay, okay. Praise God. Galatians chapter three, verse number 15 starts out. Apostle Paul is writing to the Galatian church. The Galatians started out in faith, started out God's way, believing God, miracles, signs, and wonders were being done. They were excited about the things of God. They started in the spirit, and yet they ended up in the flesh. Why? Because some men came in called the Judaizers. And they said, Jesus is cool. Jesus is just all right with me. And then what happened? They said, but you still got to hold to the law. You really want to get to God, you got to do it through the works of the flesh. You got to be circumcised. You got to hold to the Old Testament dietary laws. You got to observe the new moons, the festivals, the Sabbaths, all that kind of stuff. 
Paul starts to rebuke them, and he brings a scathing rebuke. And he says, how could you do this? How could you be bewitched? How could you be deceived? you got to stay in the Spirit. You can't come to God on your terms. It's got to be on His terms. Galatians chapter number 3, verse number 15. Starting out, take a look at it with me. It says, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. So he gives a natural example that we can understand. Speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, a man's agreement, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Notice what he says. He says that when we see people agreeing on something here on earth, somebody signed the paper for the house. After you have signed on the dotted line, what happens? You cannot add to it. You cannot take away from it. That means that if you bought a car and you said, you know what, I don't like my payment anymore. It's way too high. I mean, 300 bucks, who can afford that? I think I'm just going to pay 150. I'm going to cut it in half. You start paying 150 every month, what's going to happen? You're going to show up and say, where'd my car go? Because they've repossessed it. Same thing with your house. You say, you know what, I don't like this house anymore. don't like this neighborhood. I'm just going to stop paying. We'll just live here. You'll be able to do that for a while, but eventually they're going to come and repossess that house. Why? Because even though it's a man's covenant, no one annuls, no one adds to it afterwards if it's confirmed. If you've signed on the dotted line, that's how it is. Verse 16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, capital S, who is Christ. So notice he says, this promise was made to Abraham and to his seed, capital S, speaking of Jesus Christ. God the Father, God the Son made the agreement. And if an agreement on earth is binding, how much more so when God the Father and God the Son make an agreement in heaven? So you can either accept this or reject it, but you can't change it because this is eternal. It has been confirmed. God signed on the dotted line in the blood of Jesus. Let's read on and look at what it says in verse number 17. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. So God made promises to Abraham. Abraham, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be a blessing. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed by you. You will possess the gate of your enemies. And anybody who curses you will be cursed, but he who blesses you will be blessed. So these promises were made to Abraham, and 430 years later, another covenant came along called the law, the Mosaic covenant, if you will, that Moses brought to the children of Israel. Now it says just because there was another covenant that came alongside and got added, it doesn't annul, it doesn't take away the previous promises that were given to Abraham. Let's read on. Verse 18, for if the inheritance is of the, is of the law, it is no longer of promise. But God gave it to Abraham, how? By promise. You can either accept or you can reject, but you cannot change it. This is the terms. This is the way. And God says, I've got amazing promises for you. I've got blessings waiting for you. If you will believe and walk in faith, all of the promises of God in him, in Christ Jesus, are yes and amen to the glory of God. Are you here today? Yeah. A couple of you guys are getting it. It's okay to say amen. God's bound himself to this agreement. We can either accept it or reject it. We cannot change it. Last thing for today. Last thing for today. We enter in by faith and become heirs. Oh, I like this one. Because this is where we live today. We enter in by faith. See, it's not enough just to know about covenant. To understand it. To desire it. No, you've got to enter in. How do we enter in? Well, God's way. God says believe. Believe. He who believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth, shall be saved. See, and that's what we do when we believe God. We enter in by faith, and as soon as we enter in by faith, now we become heirs. There's an inheritance. Why? Because the one who wrote the last will and testament, Jesus Christ, he went to the cross and he died. Now that testament goes into effect, but now Jesus Christ is alive, and therefore we can live forever with him. We now have an inheritance, and it, he is our Shield, he is our exceeding and great reward. All of the promises that went to Abraham, now because we're his seed, they come to us. We get to be benefactors. Wow. There's a beautiful story in First and Second Samuel. It's just amazing. If you have some time, read through it. We find a king named Saul. King Saul was a wicked king, and therefore God sought another king who would follow after his own heart. Therefore, God finds David. David is anointed king, and David still serves and still submits to the wicked king Saul. And yet there came a time where Saul's son Jonathan came to David and their hearts were knit together. It was a pure love. They loved one another. And they made a covenant. They committed to one another. And therefore, Jonathan said to David, he said, David, I want you to show kindness to my family 
after you've become king. I know God's anointed you. I know that you're going to become king. When you do, I want you to covenant with me. I want you to come into agreement with me. And I want you to show kindness to my family. So David agrees and he cuts covenant with Jonathan. After he does that, he goes on and through a series of events, Jonathan dies, the wicked king Saul dies, and then David is anointed king. And here David is king, and after he becomes king, he's there and he says, you know what, I wonder if there's anybody left to the house of Saul that I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake. So he asks one of his servants, is there anybody in the house of Saul that I can show some kindness to? And he says, well, there is one guy, a guy by the name of Mephibosheth. Quite a name, right? So David says, bring him here. I want to be kind to him for Jonathan's sake. So bring Mephibosheth here. Now, it was customary in those days when a new kingdom came into power that they would wipe out all of the family of the old kingdom so that no one would have a claim to the throne. So here's Mephibosheth. Now, Mephibosheth, when the war was going on and when King Saul had died, they fled. They ran away. And they grabbed Mephibosheth, and he was a little guy, okay? And they were running out, and as they were running out, they dropped him. And he had dropped on his feet, and his feet were crippled, and he was lame. He couldn't walk. And so here comes Mephibosheth, and he is trembling before the king because he doesn't know why he's going there before him. King David's called for him, he sent for him, now he comes before the king, and he thinks, maybe I'm going to die at this time. So he prostrates himself before King David, and King David says, I want you to give all of the land of his grandfather Saul to him. And not only that, he can't work it, I want you to work it, my servants, and I want you to sow it, and I want you to bring forth all the produce to his account. But not only that, I don't want him eating off of that land. No, I want him to sit at my table like one of the king's sons. Why did he do all that? Because of covenant, because of agreement, because he remembered it. Now listen, this is not just a story about David and Jonathan and Mephibosheth. This is a type, this is a shadow in the Old Testament that speaks to us about our present reality today in the New Testament or the New Covenant. What is God saying? God is saying that there was a wicked king who ruled over the land ruled over all the earth, the prince of the power of the air. We know him as the devil or as Satan. And therefore, he was always after us. And we had to submit to him. We were his children. We were of that family. And yet when Jesus went to the cross and he died, there was a covenant between God the Father and God the Son that would show kindness to the family of the one who died. Now remember, Jesus took on flesh, and now he's not ashamed to call us brethren. We are of that family. He became one of us. He became one of the flesh. So now God expresses his kindness to us, and when we go before God, we expect judgment. We expect for the gavel to come down and say, you're guilty. Why? Because the accuser of the brethren, he's pointing at us, saying they're a sinner. They messed up. They didn't do it right, and yet the blood of Jesus, when it covers us, now God looks at us, and he says, I'm in covenant, and I'm going to show kindness to them. Why? On behalf of my son. Son, Jesus Christ. The blood covers them. But not only that, he now says, hey, I want you to restore all that was stolen, all of the land, all of the goods, all of the blessing poured out on them. And if that wasn't enough, he invites us to his table to eat as one of the king's kids. Wow. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. We enter in by faith. And we become heirs. You're there in the book of Galatians. Drop down to verse number 26. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 26. Let's take a look at it in the word together. It's where we're living today. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 26. Look at what it says. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Ladies, I'm sorry that you have to be sons of God, but deal with it because we've got to be the bride of Christ as men, okay? <laughs> we're all coping with that. So you know what? It's just how it is. You're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This is a beautiful image. When God looks at you from heaven, if you are a Christian, if you've given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, he no longer sees that old sinner. Now he sees you robed in a new outfit, Jesus Christ. He doesn't see that sinner. He doesn't see that stain any longer. No, there's been an exchange that's been made. Your life, your filthy rags for his life, his robe of righteousness. And now when he sees you, he sees a saint. He sees a little Christ here on the earth. He sees his son Jesus all over you, in and through you. You are now wall to wall, Holy Spirit, a child of the Most High God. You have now put on Christ. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You know what he just said? 
He just said it's not about your social, economic background. This is not about your gender anymore. All the prejudice on the earth for all that stuff is now wiped away. We are no longer a different race. There's one race, the human race. There's one blood, the blood of Jesus that unites us all together. And now we are the children of the Almighty God. We are one in Christ Jesus. Look at verse number 29. I love this. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In other words, those blessings that God promised to Abraham, we get to inherit those by faith because we are now the children of Abraham and that inheritance is passed from generation to generation. All the promises of God are yours in Christ Jesus. What did we learn today? We learned about God's amazing agreement. We learned about this covenant. Covenant is a binding agreement, the closest, most sacred of all contracts. We learn that God relates, explains, and joins himself to us. How? Through covenant. God has bound himself to this agreement. We can either accept it or we can reject it, but we cannot change it. And finally, we learn that we enter into this agreement by faith and become heirs. If you got something from the word of the Lord today, come on, give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to thank you guys for staying put. Lots of people got up, lots of people left. If you can hear my voice out there in the foyer, I know I've got speakers out there speaking to you. Also down the breezeways, hello. Uh, have a seat on one of those benches next to you and listen up because God wants to speak to you right where you're at. Also, there's some of you in the bathroom. A little awkward listening to me right now, but I know you can hear me. Finish up what you're doing and come into the foyer and listen up. God is so good to us. We want to make sure that we don't just talk about this amazing agreement of God and not give you an opportunity to get in on it. Sometimes people think, well, I'm in on it. You know, I've been a good person, done a lot of good deeds, been nice to my neighbors, gave money to charity, therefore, I'm good. God's going to let me into heaven. I get to be a Christian because I've been a good person. Well, we discussed that. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. Can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. This is not about you doing your good deeds and you get to go to heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. So we got to get there God's way. Sometimes people think, well, I was raised in church. Parents told me Christians growing up. And I know that I, I wore religious jewelry, maybe a cross or St. Christopher. Maybe they had you baptized or christened as a child. You are raised in church, went to religious classes like Sunday school, catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible says because you're raised in church, wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, be baptized as a Christian as a child, that you get to go to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're born in America that you get to go to heaven. I don't care if you're not some other religion. Sometimes people think, oh, I'm not a Buddhist, I'm not a Muslim, I'm not a Hindu, therefore I'm a Christian. Listen, God's not confused about where you're at with him. Oh, well, they're not any of these other religions. I guess that means they're a Christian. He lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying hell. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people say, well, but not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am sitting in church right now. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? Well, that's great, but show me the Bible where it says that you can sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It doesn't work. Nowhere in the Bible says sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, makes you a Christian. That's like saying you can go to the ocean, sit in the water, call yourself a fish, and that makes you a fish. Not going to happen. Can't sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, but I got involved in my last church. I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. It's great, I'm glad you did those things, but could you just show me where church involvement gets you into heaven? Or where God's waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter? It doesn't work like that. Come on, today, let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth and not play games. That's how you think you're gonna get to heaven, you're not gonna make it. Today, I love you enough to tell you the truth. Sometimes people say, but wait a second, hold on. I know God. I mean, I've memorized scriptures. I celebrate Easter, sing the songs at Christmas every year of my life. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? I wish it did, but nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you've done those things, celebrate a holiday, can memorize scripture, that makes you a Christian. In fact, if you read your Bible, you'd know the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The Bible says the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote, scriptures and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven so everybody look up at me for a second it's not about what you have in your head it's not about having mental assent towards god having had knowledge about who jesus is and that gets you right with him but rather it's about your heart all throughout the bible god's been looking for your heart jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day who's probably better than all of us in this room honestly probably memorized more scripture he could quote it he could debate it he could sing it how many of us could do that 
He was a teacher in Israel, a great man. Yet Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, hey, you're doing a great thing. Just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, rather, what does he say? He says, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, sometimes people turn off. They say, oh, I saw born again on TV or a movie or read about it on a book or the internet. And, you know, it just was weird and I don't want to have any part in it. But listen, it's not about what books and movies and television and pop culture says. Not about what our society says. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Well, it's always meant the same thing. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means that you've given God all of your heart. And that you've given God all of your life. That's simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, last book in the Bible, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Gross words from the mouth of Jesus. Pretty graphic. What's he talking about? Lukewarm. What's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God's something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hands, you're saying, I want to give God all my heart, I want to give God all my life, I want to be born again, headed for heaven, deny my presence in hell. So your hand go up, I'll count it, you put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hands, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. Let's get over that today, because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. And yet today, there's going to be that anxiety. Can I do this? Listen, Jesus went to the cross, beaten, bloody, public spectacle. You can raise your hand in a safe and friendly place. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. I'm a man, I'll see your hand go up. Can I put it right back down? Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of two? God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm? You know that's the condition of your heart when I describe it. Come on. You can get right with God. Acknowledging your need for Jesus by raising your hand. Or if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given your heart and life, come on. Speaking to you. Don't leave this place today not sure about your salvation. Let's make sure today. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online, wherever you're at all over the world. Get ready to get your hands up. God sees. Then you can tell an usher right afterwards, come into the church service. Okay? Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you. There's three up top. Got you. Four over there. Thank you. There's five up there. Got you. Thank you. Who else today? Five wise people already up, out there. Thank you. There's six. God bless you. Who else today? Six wise people already. Seven, eight, nine. Got you up there. Thank you. Nine wise people already on this side. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen back in the family room. Where are you at down here? Fourteen. Is that a hand? Okay. Who else today? Thirteen or fourteen wise people. If that's you, come on. Go for it. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. Over here. I got you right there. Thank you, number 15. God bless you. Who else today? 15 wise people already. I got to close it up because the preacher preached a bit too long. So if you all would, just let's be bold and let's do this today. Come on, go for it. If you're wavering, wondering if I'm talking to you, yeah, yeah, I'm talking to you. Thank you, number 16. God bless you. Who else today? 16 wise people already. Who else? 16 wise people already. Anybody else real quick? Just pop it up. Pop it up and wave it at me if I don't see you. Raise two hands. Praise God. What do you say we give the Lord a great big praise for 16 wise people? Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. All right, all 16 of you, real quick, I need you to do something bold. I need you to do something brave. You can do this. If it's good enough to raise your hand for it, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front. We're going to change destinies today. We can't do that till we get you down here. So even if you didn't raise your hand, you're number 17, 18, 19, 20, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't, you come right now. Come on, let's all stand and welcome them. And you come, just make your way to the front. Come on, come on, come on, come on. If you raise your hand or even if you didn't, you can come in. From the foyer, come on, you can come in right now. Come on, come on. Wherever you're at, from the family room, so you can bring your children. You're welcome. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. 
Everybody else, if you need to come, just come on. Come on, even if you didn't raise your hand. You come. Come on, come on, come on. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. You, my king, will die for me. You can come too. You can come too. It's my joy to They're still coming. Let's give them a hand. Come on, come on. They're still coming. Come on, come on, come on. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on, we'll wait for you. You come on down. There's room for you here. They're still coming. Come on. You can come too. Everybody else, if you need to come, come on, come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. All right, you guys. Hey, everybody up front, look up here. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. Thank God you guys have come. I want you guys to look over here to my right, your left. See this guy in the snazzy gray jacket and purple shirt, and they look good? This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? This is about as weird as you're going to get today, okay? He's cool. He's going to do three things. Number one thing he's going to do, he's going to pray with you. Simple prayer to invite you to invite Jesus into your heart, you're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do is give you some free information, some free literature to find out what to do next in your walk with God. You need to find out, okay? So we'll give that to you absolutely free. Third thing he's going to do, he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church that we like to call a spiritual personal trainer. Now, an SPT, as we like to call them, is someone who is a friend in church that will come alongside you and help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord so that you don't go back serving the devil and doing your old ways. But you go on the king's table in his way in this amazing agreement of God okay so he'll do that for you and he'll let you come right back out now let me make a promise to you guys give us a year of your life here at this church sitting consistently under the teaching of the word of God here at the rock okay after that year and for the rest of your years you're going to be so blessed am I telling the truth everybody all right praise the Lord so if you guys will make a left turn follow Pastor Joel let's give him a hand as they go love you Pastor Joel hallelujah God is good. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin And I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.